Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to um, the webinar for the Inherited Metabolic Disease and Coronavirus. Um, my name is Will Evans. I'm a, a GP in Leeds uh, and also the chair of Neiman Pick UK. Um, this um, webinar is a second one that we've done. We did another one now. It seems a distant memory uh, back on the 23rd of March, um, but I think it was a really useful and valuable exercise indeed. In total, more than 6,000 people have, have uh, either watched it live or subsequent to that watched a recording of the webinar. Um, this uh, webinar has been brought together by three organisations, the British Inherited Metabolic Disease Group, um, Metabolic Support UK and the LSD Collaborative. Um, I'm going to co-chair this with um, Ellen. And I'll, I'll let Ellen introduce herself. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm Ellen Hav Davis and I'm the Chair of Metabolic Support UK. Uh, I used to be a, a metabolic nurse at Great Ormond Street Hospital um, and uh, really delighted to join Will as co-chair for this uh, webinar. Um, I'm uh, very aware that Metabolic Support UK, as well as many of the other patient advocacy group has sort of been working incredibly hard <laughs> during this uh, challenging time um, and I've been um, incredibly impressed with the resilience of the, the metabolic community. So very grateful to have uh, such a great uh, panel, which we'll, we'll, we'll introduce later. Um, but to start with, I think I'm just going to present a little bit of housekeeping to those that may not be familiar with webinars and may or may not have uh, joined before. Uh, so if we can have the next slide uh, just to uh, talk through, there will be, um, there is a, a chat uh, Q&A box, so please submit your questions online as you as you think of them and both Will and myself will keep an eye on, on those questions coming through and we'll uh, provide uh, questions after the webinar. Um, please do remember that uh, we won't be able to address any specific patient or specific condition questions um, but you know the, the patient advocacy groups are all available to, to offer practical social care or financial support uh, if you need anything uh, after after this webinar as well. So um, I will hand over to Will now to introduce the panel and very much look forward to, to hearing the, the updates from them all. Um, thanks, Ellen. Um, so we've got a, a great expert panel um, who uh, are going to be talking us through different aspects of the effect of COVID-19 on our community. Um, so we'll start off with Dr. Robin Lachman from the Charles Dent Metabolic Unit at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Um, we've also got um, Roshni Vara from the Evelina, so a paediatrician, uh, and then further in adult insight from Elaine Murphy, who also works with uh, Robin Lachman at the Charles Dent Metabolic Unit. Um, so there is a representation from the north of England. We've got Dr. Simon Jones from um, the Willink Unit at Manchester, a paediatrician in inherited metabolic disease, uh, and also uh, Dr. Lynn Aitkenhead, who's a clinical psychologist, who's going to be giving us some, some insights, and she works uh, at the Charles Dent Metabolic Unit at, at the National Hospital with Robin and Elaine. Um, so I think this is a, it's a great panel um, who were present on the, on the original webinar, and we hope to give us a, a great update about what's happening, and as obviously as the NHS starts to open up, how that's going to impact our community. Um, so I'll pass over, over to Robin to give us an update. Thank you, Robin. Okay, thanks very much, Will. So I'm going to start off by talking about shielding, um, something that's been a lot of concern to a lot of patients and doctors and certainly taken up a huge amount of doctor time. Um, and we'll start off with what shielding is what it was designed to do what's involved so uh, this came from a piece of work by the government and public health england trying to protect vulnerable people really <coughs> a bigger pardon and they came out with this guidance on shielding protecting people who were going to be extremely vulnerable to covid19 so those who were a particularly high risk of having a severe infection and needing hospital and itu care and the idea was both to be able to identify those patients and try and protect them from the virus. Next slide, please. But also because we knew that there were going to be real stresses on healthcare systems at this point to try and 
protect the NHS and prevent the NHS from being overwhelmed. And so we know with this condition that the vast majority of people actually have asymptomatic or mild disease, um, but there is a significant proportion of people, next slide please, <coughs> probably about 20 to 30 percent of those who are diagnosed with COVID-19 who will need hospital admission. And at this point it's worth pointing out that 20 to 30 percent of patients, are those are the ones who've actually had a positive test for COVID-19 and we know that the vast majority of people who get this disease certainly in the past haven't been tested. Uh, so it's probably not 20 to 30 percent of people who get the disease who need hospital admission, it's going to be less than that. And 4% of those patients who've had a positive test for COVID-19 for coronavirus will need ICU care. And when you're talking about a pandemic, an epidemic where you're expecting hundreds of thousands, millions of people to be infected, uh, then 4% of those people needing ICU care puts a severe strain on even developed healthcare systems like ours, uh, let alone healthcare systems in the third world. And so as well as protecting individual patients, uh, the idea was to identify patients who were particularly likely to be severely infected and need that ICU care and try and prevent them from getting the infection in this first peak of infection uh, so as to, to, to spare some of the ICU capacity. Next slide, please. So the first question was, who are these patients going to be? Who is it who's actually going to be uh, most at risk of a severe infection that's going to need admission and ICU care? Um, next slide, please. And so uh, the Department of Health got together a group of uh, public health clinicians and they asked for advice uh, from the NHS via the clinical reference groups to come up with a list of patients who would be extremely vulnerable to infection. And this is the list they ended up with. And it really concentrates pretty much on two things. It's those whose immune system isn't working properly and therefore are at risk of from any viral infection of being overwhelmed by that infection. And that's where you get people who've had organ transplants because they're on immunosuppressive drugs. Again, people with cancers who are on immunosuppressive drugs, lots of chemotherapy affects the immune system and makes you much more susceptible to infection. And some people with rare genetic diseases that give you immunosuppression as well, and immunosuppressive drugs for some other conditions. So there were the patients with an immune system that didn't work very well, and then the second group were patients with severe underlying respiratory disease. So patients who, if they get even a mild a cold or, or cough, end up needing oxygen end up needing hospital care and ICU care and therefore would be extremely likely to get it severely unwell with this virus and so that would be diseases like cystic fibrosis, severe uh, smoking related COPD. And on top of that there was a group number four in this list of patients with certain rare diseases and inborn errors of metabolism that would significantly increase the risk of them becoming unwell because of their disease if they had an infection of any sort. So if you have an inborn merit metabolism where you're prone to metabolic decompensation, that can happen with any viral infection. And therefore we thought that COVID-19 infection would probably be another potential trigger for metabolic decompensation. Next slide, please. So when we looked at our um, group of patients, uh, we would have patients who fell into a couple of those, um, well, more than two of those uh, groups. There are patients who are immunosuppressed. We have patients who've had organ transplants and therefore would be shielding for that reason, but they would have been informed by their transplant doctors. From the point of view of underlying inherited metabolic disease itself, there are certainly patients with significant respiratory disease. And then there is this group of patients who might have a metabolic decompensation if they got infected with the virus, which might need them to go to ICU at a time when ICU beds were at a premium and therefore we prefer they wouldn't get the virus, even though they weren't necessarily going to have a severe pneumonia due to the COVID infection itself. So NHS England then asked us to identify the specific diseases uh, where these patients might be, where there might be patients who are at extreme risk. And so what you've got here is two lists, those who we felt uh, were at a risk of having significant respiratory compromise due to their disease, and that included uh, diseases that affect the muscles of respiration, Pompe disease, Leishmanisterius disease type 3, disease that affects the lungs themselves, pneumothic disease type B, and some diseases that affect the airways uh, as well, which is where the mucopolysaccharidosis came in. Now that was a relatively small and well-defined group, and then there was the rose at risk of met metabolic decompensation, and it's easy enough to say that that can happen with urea cycle disorders, it can happen with fatty acid oxidation disorders, it can happen with the organic acidemias, uh, but it doesn't happen to every patient, and we'll come back to this later. There are certain patients who we know have metabolic decompensations, at the least uh, viral infection, but there are other patients who really don't decompensate at all. <clears throat> 
So we provided these lists to NHS England and we actually said we'd be happy to identify the patients for you and contact them, um, but they didn't want that. So going on, next slide, please. So they decided they'd actually rather identify all of these patients centrally, um, including the patients with cancer and uh, immunosuppression and things. And so they took the list of patients we gave them and gave it to their data people who had to come up with a way of finding all these patients. And the way they do that is to look at what's called coding in the NHS. So when you interact with the NHS at almost any level, um, that interaction, be it a GP visit, a visit to outpatients, an operation going to A&E is coded. Um, and they code things like what operation you had. So if you had an appendicectomy, if you had an x-ray, that'll get coded. If we prescribe you some drugs, that gets coded. But they also code the individual diseases. So there are a group of codes called ICD-10, or International Classification of Disease 10 Codes, which are given to every disease, including uh, the inherited metabolic diseases. And so if you look at the list here of these diseases that could give metabolic decompensation, uh, I've highlighted in yellow um, the fatty acid oxidation disorders and the organic acidemias. And after that, you can see their ICD-10 code. So they have a complicated code with a letter um, and then some numbers after it. And so in principle, if you could find the patients who had, for instance, the E71.311 code, you'd find all the patients with um, NCAD deficiency. The problem is that the NHS doesn't use the whole of the code. It doesn't use E71.3111. It only goes as far as E71.3. And so next slide. And so the people at the NHS England said, actually for these ones, if they, because they're not all E71.3, there's E71.0, E71.2, if they just use the E71 code, anything that had E71 in front of it, then they should find all the patients we were after. Next slide, please. And to some extent that's true. This is a list of all the diseases that come under E71. It does indeed include all those diseases on the last slide. The problem is it includes a whole load of other diseases as well, and a whole load of diseases that aren't necessarily uh, at extreme risk of COVID-19. And so next slide. Uh, for instance, um, it picked up X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy because that has an E71.52 code. And so that means that when NHS England decided to contact all the patients for whom they could find this code, either in their GP record or in hospital records and send them a text or a letter about shielding, they ended up sending a shielding letter to everybody with XALD or adrenal myelineuropathy who really shouldn't have been on that list at all. And that led to a lot of confusion um, amongst patients and amongst doctors about what was actually going on. Next slide, please. So other diseases were included, that was a problem. The other problem was that even for the diseases which we'd identified, not everybody was at extreme risk. So as I said before, with the diseases that cause metabolic decompensation, not everybody is at risk of metabolic decompensation. And NCAT is a particularly good example where there's a small number of patients who are very brittle, who can get hypoglycemic at the least uh, metabolic challenge, including infection, but the majority of whom actually won't have problems at all. And if they'd asked the clinicians, uh, we would have come up with a much smaller list of patients who we considered as extremely vulnerable. Next slide, please. Just some other examples of other areas in inherited metabolic disease where we had the same problem. So for Pompe disease, which I say causes respiratory a compromise and a proportion of the patients with Pompe disease have really bad lung disease and would definitely need to be shielded. The code for that is E74.02, but they couldn't code that. So they used E74.0 and that brought in all of the glycogen storage diseases. So if you had glycogen storage disease type one, von Gerke disease, you got a shielding letter notification, even though you shouldn't have done. Next slide, please. And one other example for the lysosomal storage diseases where we were trying to identify patients with Neiman Pick disease type B, which gives you a, a lung disease in some patients, again, E75.241. We can't code that deep. We can only code to E75.2. And that brought in everybody with Fabry disease, everybody with Gaucher disease, Cravy disease, metachromatic leukodystrophy. And although there are some patients with Fabry disease who've had organ transplants, for instance, uh, who should have been on the shielding list, that should have come from their transplant doctors, not from their inherited metabolic disease doctors. So again, a whole load of patients who really shouldn't have been on the list were getting notifications that they needed to shield. Next slide, please. And again, for these groups, there's also the problem that everybody's different. Next slide. And so not everybody with one of these conditions also was at extremely high risk. Not everybody with Neiman Pick disease type B has significant lung disease. A lot of people don't and didn't need to shield. So again, unfortunately, there wasn't room for that individual judgment uh, between patients and, and their clinicians to decide whether they were actually at extreme risk or not. 
And that's something we probably need to think about going forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so they come up with this list. It wasn't perfect uh, for who would need to be shielding. Um, what did shielding actually involve? So this is the initial guidance that came out and it was really very, very strict. So those who are extremely vulnerable should not leave their homes full stop. So you weren't supposed to leave your home at all. And even within the home, you had to minimize all non-essential contact with other members of your household. And given that what we were identifying here was on the whole a group of patients who already had quite severe underlying illness, that's a big ask. Um, these patients are not on the whole independent and self-caring. They do need support. A lot of them need a lot of support and a lot of them would have had carers and other support coming into the house. And as part of the shielding guidelines, there was also this very strict face-to-face -face distancing measures. And that basically meant that nobody should be coming into your house who wasn't a member of your household. And therefore, if you were doing shielding properly, then actually all of the care that was coming into your house, be it personal care, people coming in to look after you, or be it health care, people coming in to give you treatments at home, that had to stop. And Elaine will come on to this later, but a lot of people actually had to make a decision about whether they were going to stop their treatment or take that risk going forward. It is important to note that all of this was not, these are not hard and fast rules, uh, these were recommendations and it was left up to the patient to some extent to decide uh, to what extent they could follow this guidance. But if you were doing it properly, it really was very severe and would be very difficult to maintain for the full three month period up until the end of June that it was initially brought in for. Next slide please. So what happened last week? Well, last Monday, the government announced that it was changing uh, the shielding guidelines and they sent this letter out on Tuesday. So actually they hadn't told anybody uh, within the NHS that this was gonna happen, certainly not any of the clinicians. So the reason you weren't warned is that nobody knew. Uh, the guidance was changed, it was changed quite subtly. And the reason it was changed, if you look in the yellow box at the bottom, uh, was that they felt now that we were over that first peak of infection uh, that the levels of infections and the number of infected people in the community was coming down and on average now there's only they felt one in 420 people who had an active COVID infection at any time and therefore uh, it was safer for people uh, to be interacting with other people because the risk of catching the infection was much less. The other side of that is of course that the number of hospital admissions, the number of people in hospital, the number of people in ITU was also going down so the NHS had more capacity again uh, to look after patients. Next slide please. So what did the guidance actually change? Well, it's certainly, if you go to the website, the website changed quite a lot. And one of the things they did was that all of a sudden there wasn't just one list of patients who were clinically extremely vulnerable and high risk. They've introduced a second list of patients, another list of patients who are at moderate risk, clinically vulnerable and advice for those. And we'll come on to that in a minute, but that's actually quite a useful uh, distinction to make, I think. Next slide. If we look at the people who were clinically extremely vulnerable at high risk then, although they've changed the um, setup of the list a bit, basically it's very similar, it's patients with immunosuppression, it's patients with severe underlying lung disease. Interestingly, any mention of patients who's at risk of their own disease getting worse because of COVID infection, like our inherited metabolic disease patients with metabolic decompensations, doesn't seem to be there anymore. I don't think they asked any of us about that. And Elaine will talk about this a bit later. Actually, looking at the data we have now, we probably think that actually getting COVID infection isn't a particularly high risk for people decompensating, and so that's probably all right. And if you fall into one of these groups, what do you have to do? Well, you have to still follow the shielding advice. And if we go on to the next slide. So that's been made visually nicer again. Um, this from a communication point of view there are lots of do's rather than lots of don'ts now which is always a good thing but basically it's not that different do not have visitors inside your home including friends and family unless they're providing essential care do not stay stop taking any prescription medicines without speaking to your doctor but you are allowed to go outside now so you can go outside once a day providing you can follow social distancing requirements um, and that's the major change and actually that's a good change people are actually allowed to get out of the house um, and at least get a bit of fresh air and exercise. Next slide, please. So what about that other group, the people at moderate risk, clinically vulnerable? That group list of patients who are at high risk and extremely vulnerable is actually quite a small group of patients and will become smaller, I think, as time goes on now, they've changed the criteria. This is a much larger group of patients. This includes all those patients over 70 who were initially in advised to stay at home and follow strict social distancing because of age being the major risk factor for this disease. But it will also include a lot of other patients 
including patients with inherited metabolic disease who have underlying heart disease, uh, underlying kidney disease, underlying liver disease. Um, what do these patients have to do? Well, actually, the advice for moderate risk patients is very different. You should try and stay at home as much as possible. You should observe social distancing, but actually you can go out to work if you need to. Um, you can probably go to school if you need to, although that information isn't there specifically. So it's much more about social distancing um, and maintaining uh, your activity as much as you can, rather than locking yourself away, which is what shielding was about. And I think that's quite a useful distinction to make going forward. Next slide, please. This advice is only in place until the end of June. So like the initial sheathing advice, it was meant to be there until the 30th of June. And the reason for that was that we hoped that we'd be over the first peak of infection by then, and we'd be able to look at things going forwards, to look at what had happened during that first peak of infection and decide who really was at high risk and who really wasn't, and decide what we needed to do in order to protect those who are vulnerable and protect the NHS going forward. And the government is going to review these shielding guidelines and actually it's next Monday, which is the date that they've confirmed that review will take place and they will be contacting everybody who's on the shielded patient list with information about what the next steps on shielding will be, what shielding will be beyond the 30th of June. Unfortunately, none of us actually know what that advice is going to be. Um, and at the moment, I can't tell you anything about it because I don't know either. But there should be something coming out at some point next week or the week after. Next slide, please. OK, so why is that advice going to change? Um, why might it be possible for people to be a little bit more relaxed going forward than they have been over this first peak? Well, here again, this is the peak uh, shown in, in deaths. This is mortality in the UK um, over the last few weeks. And you can see that there was this big peak of, infect of deaths, which is now fortunately coming down. The other thing in this slide is really to show you that the main risk factor for this disease is age. It's age uh, that is the main factor determining whether you're going to have a severe infection or not. And you can see from the graph, so everyone who's in green or red or black uh, is over 75. So the vast majority of deaths have actually been in the over 75s. And fortunately, uh, younger patients uh, seem to be relatively protected. Next slide, please. And at the same time as we're over that first peak in the terms of mortality, that also means uh, that there are fewer patients uh, being diagnosed. Uh, there are fewer patients being admitted to hospital, there are fewer patients being on ICU, and so all of these graphs are coming down. And over the next weeks and months, we would hope uh, that the levels will continue to decrease, although what we don't know is what the effects of um, relaxing social distancing will be. Next slide. And therefore, it should be possible to relax the guidelines a bit. The problem to that, however, is that although there has been a lot of death and a lot of disease, it's still only a very small proportion of us who've actually had this virus. Because we haven't been testing everybody, you can't be absolutely certain about how many of us have had it, and certainly it's going to be more than the number of positive tests the government report. But we can try and look across the population and see whether we can get an idea of how many people have been exposed to the virus by looking at their blood and looking for the presence of antibodies in their blood. Now, antibodies are something that the body makes once it's been exposed to infectious agent. I'm gonna talk about that for a couple of, in a couple of minutes of time. But this is some work that's been done looking at blood donors, uh, looking at the percentage of blood donors from different regions of the UK who have evidence in their blood that they've been exposed to the novel coronavirus. And you'll see that it's very low. In London, it might be up to about 14%, but in other parts of the country, it's much less. And nationwide, it seems likely that it's probably only seven or 8% of us uh, who've been exposed to this virus as far as we can tell. And that means that there's still 90% or more of us who are still going to be susceptible. Uh, so if the virus is circulating, 90% of us could still catch it in the future. Next slide, please. And that means that we could have further peaks in the future. So this is just a slide showing you, um, again, death rates uh, month, week by week, month by month over the last few years. And you can see that it goes up and down. And every winter, we have a spike in deaths that's nearly mostly put down to flu. So you can see that the flu uh, in 2015-16, we had a very mild flu year in 1718. We had quite a lot of excess flu deaths, but it all pales into insignificance compared to that last spike in the graph, which is the excess deaths we've had because of coronavirus. And that's because with flu, 
One, most of us have had some form of flu at some time in the past, so we have partial resistance. And so when a new form of flu comes along, not everybody's susceptible to it. A number of us actually have good antibodies and are, and are resistant. And two, we vaccinate against flu. So we know, or we think we know, what sort of flus might be coming along that year. And we try and make sure that particularly the vulnerable healthcare workers as well uh, get vaccinated to reduce the number of people who are actually susceptible to the infection when it comes down along and keep the number of people uh, who are going to end up being severely ill down. And with coronavirus, we just haven't been able to do that. There's no natural immunity or very little as far as we know, nothing like there is for flu, and there's no vaccination available. And so that spike at the end there probably represents what happens when at most 15% of us have been affected. And that means that there's another six times that um, potentially to come in the future, either as future spikes um, or just as an increased constant rate of um, mortality. So what can we do about that? Because we can't really think about relaxing, shielding, um, stopping protecting the vulnerable until we've actually dealt with that issue that everybody's still susceptible to this infection. Next slide, please. So this is where the immune system comes in. So as I think we said in the last webinar, a virus is really just a package of genes uh, which is in an envelope that delivers it to a cell. When it infects a cell, it takes over that cell. It takes over the mechanism of that cell in order to replicate itself, to make more viruses. And then those viruses burst out of the cell, go on and infect other cells, and rapidly more and more cells become infected in the body and you get disease. Next slide, please. Now, if the body didn't have a way of defending itself against that, then all viral infections would rapidly be fatal. But fortunately, uh, the immune system is the body's way of making sure that that doesn't happen and basically as soon as a cell gets infected by a virus and that virus starts using the cell to make its own proteins instead of doing what it normally does the body can detect that there are lymphocytes in the body that patrol the tissues looking for virally infected cells and when they find one they kill it so the idea is that the immune system knocks out the virus by finding the cells that are infected and killing them and hence killing the virus as well before it actually goes on to infect other cells and um, people who get better from coronavirus and don't get severe infection, that's because their, their cell-mediated immune response reacts quickly to the coronavirus and gets rid of it before it causes overwhelming disease. So that's what happens when you've already got an viral infected cell. The body also then makes antibodies and antibodies are there in order to try and make sure that if that virus, you come into contact with that virus again in the future, it never even establishes an infection. So antibodies are also circulating in the blood. They're patrolling the blood, if you like, looking for viruses. And if they find a virus they've seen before, they will bind to it and they will stop it from ever infecting the cell uh, so that you never get a viral infection established. And that's what immunity is. If you've had a virus once, uh, then with any luck, you won't get it again because the antibodies will fight it off before it ever gets into your cells. Next slide, please. So vaccination is a way of trying to get the body to make those antibodies without having had the viral infection itself. And the way you do that is to, in, is to vaccinate a patient. You inject them uh, with a harmless amount of form of the disease or with a part of the disease, a part of the viral protein, uh, which gets injected and then the body sees that and makes antibodies to it. And then when the virus comes along, those antibodies that it's made to that bit of the virus will actually bind the whole virus and stop it from infecting cells. And that's what vaccination is about, trying to make sure that you can vaccinate the whole of a population and give them antibodies to a virus so that they don't get infected in the first place. Next slide, please. And historically, it's been extremely successful. So this is just um, a slide showing you what happened to diphtheria, to whooping cough and to measles after the introduction of vaccines many years ago now. And really this led to um, much, much lower levels in the case of diphtheria, really an eradication of the disease altogether. So although you'll hear a lot of things about we don't know what's going to happen with the vaccine, um, if we find a vaccine that actually makes antibodies that do bind to the virus effectively, then there's every reason to hope that that would be an effective vaccine and would prevent people from becoming infected. And going forward, uh, that's how we get out of this problem, uh, by being able to develop a vaccine, vaccinate everybody, and then actually not have to worry about the fact that the virus is circulating in the population because people will be resistant to it. Next slide, please. So these were just some questions that have come in between the two webinars that we were asked to answer and to some extent why we've given these, I've given the talk I've just given. So why is the guidance chained to those shielding when the impact of other relaxing measures not yet known and we're still at stage four? Well, that's a good question and I'm not sure I'm the person to answer it. Uh, but the idea is that uh, as the 
the rates of infection come down, as the number of people who are infectious uh, secreting the virus in the community comes down, then you should be able to relax the measures. Is it really safe for shielding patients and families to go outside? Again, a difficult question to answer, but probably the answer is yes. There seems no doubt now from the evidence we have that the virus spreads much more effectively inside. That's true of lots of these respiratory viruses. It's why they tend to be around in the winter when we're all together inside coughing on each other and not in the summer when we're outside and further apart. So providing you can maintain that social distancing, then probably being outside is very good. But if you're in a crowded place, then maybe not so good. Will those shielding have to remain largely so until a vaccine is found? Well, ideally we'll have a vaccine, but again, because the rates of uh, carriage in the population, the number of people who might potentially infect you changes, when it's low, uh, you could probably have to be less strict about the shielding than you do when it's high. So if there's a second wave, uh, you might have to get very strict again. And then a good question again, when will it be safe to resume carers coming into the home? And I think this will get picked up later as well. Um, it's not sustainable for people to not have the care they need for long periods of time. For many people, many patients decided it wasn't sustainable even for the short period of time uh, between when we bought in shielding and the end of June. And the NHS is definitely thinking about how best to make sure people are getting the care they need at home rather than having to come into hospitals. And that's gonna involve a combination of making sure carers have PPE, uh, trying to reduce the number of individual clients carers are going to see, um, et cetera, et cetera, perhaps testing. Um, but at the moment, it's really a matter of making an individual judgment of risk and benefit as regards you. Um, and that's going to be different for every patient. So I think I'm going to stop there and hand over to Elaine um, and probably not come back until maybe there are some questions at the end. Thanks, Robin. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Elaine Murphy. So I also work at the Charles Dent Metabolic Unit in Queen Square looking after um, adults with inherited metabolic disease. And I'm going to really deal with two things um, in my section of the talk. Um, many people were obviously interested in, well, what has happened to patients with inherited metabolic disease during the pandemic? And if we deal first with patients at home, um, we have spoken to many patients on the telephone, particularly towards the beginning of the pandemic, so early March, um, coming into April, who had symptoms that were very suggestive of COVID. Um, they, we didn't have access to testing then, as you know, they didn't require going into hospital. Some may or may not have had um, need to use their emergency regimen if they had one of those, but most of those patients recovered at home. Unfortunately, we will never have exact numbers for those cases. But what we have been able to count are the number of patients with metabolic disease who have had to be hospitalized and who've had a confirmed positive COVID test since they have been hospitalized. Um, so we did a survey across all the large pediatric and adult centers in the UK. So this included Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And you can see the numbers are very small. So there have only been five hospitalizations in children who've been confirmed COVID positive. None of those children required support with their ventilation or intubation in ITU. And fortunately, all children recovered and there were no deaths. Again, looking at adults, we've had more admissions, as you might imagine, um, because this is largely a disease of adults. Um, so eight patients have been hospitalized with COVID. None of them required non-invasive ventilation, but one patient was intubated. And um, all of those patients have recovered. And again, there were no deaths. So in fact, as far as we're aware, no patients with either inherited metabolic disease or lysosomal storage disorder in the UK have died due to a COVID infection. Of course, sadly, we have had other deaths within the community, but we don't over this period of time over the last few months, but we don't think that they were related directly to COVID. If we look at those people who have been hospitalized, we can't identify any single inherited metabolic disease that's associated with increased risk. So there were probably six or seven different conditions reflected um, in those patients who were hospitalized. So no, no single disorder popped up as a particular risk. Next slide. Interestingly, and again, this is across all centres, we've actually seen far fewer admissions than normal amongst our patient group with metabolic decompensation. Um, it's not easy to say exactly why this is. We don't think that people were unwell and staying at home and not attending hospital when they're extremely unwell, because we would hope that most of you would have at least been in contact with your local centre. But obviously the protective measures 
against COVID also work very well against other viruses and infections. So if you're socially distancing, regularly hand washing, staying at home, etc., you don't get exposed to any viruses. And we know that viral infection is a particular uh, trigger factor for metabolic decompensation. So by not being exposed to viruses, um, our patients were not getting as much metabolic decompensation as usual. We also know from talking to people on the telephone that everybody has been really looking after themselves and there's, we've had very regular requests for prescriptions, for our dietary supplements, and most patients have been asking for up-to-date copies of their emergency regimens and many people have told us that they've taken this time to really focus on being quite regular with medications and uh, dietary prescriptions and I expect it's the combination of those things that have helped and that have, have meant that we haven't needed and um, to have very many patients admitted. Next slide. So those of you who have a lysosomal storage disorder and have been treated by enzyme replacement therapy, the pandemic has really affected the provision of your treatment. Um, so we put treatment on hold or paused it for some of the most vulnerable patients. Um, we asked patients to pause their therapy for a, a few months. And then there were other patients where we felt there wasn't that much of a risk, but either patient or family choice, they chose to stop their intravenous therapy. So these are the numbers from the various different diseases. So of 560 patients um, who were on intravenous therapy, for example, for Fabry disease, 87 patients either paused their therapy or because there's an oral therapy, which is suitable for some patients with Fabry disease, they chose to switch to oral therapy. Um, Pompey disease, 34 of 134 patients um, had their treatment put on hold, Gaucher, 25, etc. And there's all, also an oral therapy for Gaucher disease, so some patients switched to oral therapy, which was then um, delivered to their home. You will see that the majority of people um, whose therapy was put on hold were adults. And again, that fits with what we've been saying um, over and over again, that this is largely a disease of adults and age is one of the biggest risk factors for vulnerability. Next slide. It's also perfect, uh, affected the provision of our just standard monitoring and hospital treatment. So most of you again will know that any normal surveillance or monitoring for complications of your condition has been either stopped completely or dramatically reduced over the last few months. So this will include things like echocardiograms, lung function testing, um, imaging or x-rays, bone density scans, etc. Unfortunately, a small number of patients have also ha had to have planned surgery delayed. Next slide. So what we're about now going forward, now that the number of cases in the community has reduced, is reopening the NHS. We, we have got to the point where the risk benefit between pausing or putting a break on normal NHS treatments is likely to increase the risk from your original underlying condition. So we need to decide on how best to continue to protect the most vulnerable patients while at the same time adjusting our provision of NHS services in order to be able to manage chronic conditions going forward. Next slide. So in order to try and standardise this as much as possible across the UK and provide a fair service to as many patients as possible across the UK and to learn from each other, we've held a number of uh, virtual online meetings. We've held a separate meeting for the, the teams looking after children um, and the teams looking after adults. Um, so for each meeting, we had a representative from each of the metabolic centres involved. And again, that included Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland. The paediatric meeting was held at the beginning of May, led by James Davison from Great Ormond Street Hospital and Hugh Lamont from the Evelina Children's Hospital. And just as of yesterday, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health has produced a document on their website about services for children going forward. So that's publicly available. You can have a look at that document. And they have effectively recommended two groups with regard to ongoing shielding. 
group A, where it's quite clear cut that ongoing shielding will be recommended, and then group B, where it will depend on MDT is multidisciplinary, so effectively your metabolic team and any other specialities involved in your care, how they feel about that. And this document also gives guidance on how the NHS would open up with regard to children. Next slide. So similarly, we did the same thing for the adult teams and we had a representative from each centre meeting uh, towards the end of May. Um, we agreed to align with the broad principles of the paediatric document. So you know, if you're 17 and you're moving from paediatric to adult care, things shouldn't change dramatically. And we've also taken a lot of advice and guidance from other specialities. So for example, the respiratory specialist will give advice about respiratory involvement in inherited metabolic disease, cardiologists may be involved, etc. Next slide. And after those meetings, we agreed some basic principles that we will all try and apply um, across the metabolic teams in the UK. We do need to recognise that things, this is an unknown. Um, this is the first time most of us have lived through a pandemic such as this. Um, we're aware that at the moment there is different geographical prevalence of COVID-19 in the UK. So each centre may not be able to take things forward at the same speed. We also know that there is no centre in the UK, no metabolic centre that hasn't have had some of their staff and resources either redeployed to either go on to COVID wards or into the ITU or who may have had staff who either need to shield themselves or who have been unwell and in hospital. So none of the centres have the same number of staff as, as we would have had before the pandemic started. We also have, um, for various different reasons within each centre, slightly different case mix of the number of extremely vulnerable or not so vulnerable patients between centres. And so we may again be moving at different rates because of that. We all work for different hospital trusts and they may have slightly different uh, advice with regard to reopening of outpatient clinics, how we will arrange investigations, how we will bring people into our day wards, et cetera, that we will need to take into account. So overall, we're going to need to have quite flexible approach to any recommendations that are made as, and as these might also need to change very rapidly, particularly if there's any local or national resurgence of COVID-19. In other words, if there's a second wave or what looks like a, a second wave. Next slide. So we agreed in general, and this has always been the case, that if you have um, urgent or emergency symptoms related to your metabolic condition, please do attend hospital for urgent or emergency care as usual. There are pathways in accident and emergency. You will be checked whether or not you have COVID symptoms and people are directed accordingly. So please do come to hospital if you have symptoms that suggest something urgent is happening. And um, everyone who normally has an emergency regimen should check that you have one at home, make sure it's up to date, contact your metabolic team um, and make sure you have any prescribed medications that go along with that emergency regimen. We've agreed that as local services allow, and if we deem it clinically appropriate, we're going to move forward with trying to see more newly referred patients face to face from July 2020. There will also be the option of telephone and video consultations at most centres, but for newly referred patients, it is very difficult to do a proper assessment unless it's done face to face. Next slide. So we've agreed with regard to shielding that each unit is going to separately review the patients currently on their shielding list this month. We'll make decisions locally as a team as to which patients will remain on this list from July the 1st. We will write to patients to inform them whether or not we feel they need to remain on the shielding list. We'll try and give you a reason for that. We will let your GP know at the same time. We also agreed that from July onwards, patients for whom enzyme replacement therapy is currently on hold will be recommended or advised that the risk benefit is likely to be in favour of restarting ERT from that time. You will still have a choice whether to restart or not. And we recognise that some patients are very nervous um, about restarting therapy and having home care nurses, nursing team come to their home. But again, going back to what is the, the prevalence, what's the rate in the community at the moment, we feel that risk benefit is now moving towards restarting enzyme replacement therapy for most, though perhaps not all patients. The reason we had to stop therapy for many patients was because patients 
we're using home care nursing services. But actually there's a substantial proportion of patients um, who were completely independent or were semi-independent. In other words, they could do most of the process themselves. And we've had a real interest in more patients and families becoming more independent with giving the ERT themselves at home. In other words, not requiring external nurses coming in. And we're going to be hopefully supporting patients with that going forward. We had the goal that when we asked people to shield, we would try and keep in touch with them every eight to 10 weeks. And we're going to continue to try and do that, but recognizing that it may be very difficult for some centers because it's going to depend on the number of staff that are available. Next slide. So how are hospital services going to reopen? Um, anyone who's had or who has supposed to have had an outpatient appointment in the last um, two to three months probably won't have been seen face to face. So routine face to face outpatient appointments have generally been suspended across the UK and have either been replaced with telephone or video consultations unless they have been deemed very urgent. Most trusts are now moving, but very slowly towards reopening more face to face services. The reason this is very slow is because it needs to be done in the context of social distancing within hospitals. So we need to consider how many people are walking down corridors. We need to consider how many people are sitting in waiting rooms. We need to maintain a two meter distance between individual patients in waiting rooms. We have an increase in infection control measures in hospitals, which slow things down. So if you are seen in an outpatient room, that room will be cleaned before you enter and after you leave before the next patient is allowed to enter. So time needs to be allowed for that. There is additional cleaning of equipment, so things like x-ray scanners between patients. All the rooms within hospitals have been checked to ensure that they have adequate airflow and ventilation, and some clinic rooms have had to be closed so that there are fewer clinic rooms available. And we spoke already about staffing numbers. So for various reasons, our staffing numbers are likely to be lower at present than they have been in the past. So the bottom line is, unfortunately, fewer patients can be seen per day in outpatients, fewer investigations can be done per day, and fewer patients can be admitted electively to the hospital, because in the wards, there also needs to be social distancing. And there, there is likely to be an increase in waiting times for non-urgent issues. Next slide. The process will also change. So if you're booked for an elective procedure, it's very likely that you're going to be asked to isolate at home for 14 days prior to your hospital admission. If you're booked for a procedure, you're going to be tested for COVID-19 prior to your admission. So that will probably be about 48 hours before you come to the hospital and you will need to have a negative test in order for your elective procedure to go ahead. Every hospital will have specific designated COVID positive or COVID free areas. These are likely to be color coded. So you'll hear things like green and blue pathways. There'll actually be specific entrances and routes through many hospitals. So the hospitals may be one way. There'll be specific areas that you can only walk into if you're known to be COVID free, for example. All of the staff in hospitals will be wearing masks and it's likely that many patients, if they can, will also be asked to wear masks. The number of parents or carers allowed in a hospital with a patient will be limited, probably to one. And similarly, if you're coming for an outpatient appointment, if you're an adult and are otherwise cognitively and physically able, you will be asked to come on your own. Obviously, you can travel with someone, but they will be asked to stay outside the hospital. And you're going to be given time slots or clinic appointments, which obviously always happens, um, but these may need to be adhered to more strictly because of all the uh, extra cleaning infection control procedures. Um, I suspect in general, patients will be better at doing that than doctors, but we will try. Um, and the bottom line is that this is to avoid the reintroduction of COVID into hospitals. So the number of cases of patients with COVID in hospitals has also declined dramatically. But what we do not want to do is reintroduce um, that back into the hospital and then allow a uh, spread of COVID within hospitals and transfer of COVID to vulnerable patients, because realistically, it's only the most vulnerable patients who really need care who are going to be coming to hospital over the next few months. Next slide. So how are we going to do all this? Well, for many years, we've been trying to increase our access to technology and suddenly it's all happened. So all of the red tape has disappeared. 
um, and we've all been given access to a lot more technology to support us in our role, which has become quite different over the last few months. So just as one example, since the start of the pandemic within our trust, we've been given dual computer screens, which makes it much easier to be talking to a patient, looking up results, etc. Good quality headsets and microphones and webcams, none of which we had before. We've also been given access to new software. So there's a software, for example, called Attend Anywhere, which has allowed us to do video consultations, either with you in your home, um, you in your GP surgery, if that would be helpful, or for us to run our metabolic outreach clinics um, by involving clinicians from other centers. Um, another very useful piece of software, which has arrived in recent weeks, is something called Health Information Exchange, which allows us to access your records um, at your GP and some other hospitals who've joined up to this system. So that if you get blood um, tests or other investigations done locally, we'll be able to see them directly. And then we have, all have access to a piece of software called Microsoft Teams. So we've been running our meetings virtually. So we, through this, we can look at x-rays, we can look at laboratory results with the whole team together, even though we're all in different places and we can make decisions. And it is likely that video and telephone consultation is going to be the first line option for the majority of patients, at least until the end of this year. But the plan is that these options will continue to be offered because actually for many patients, um, they've been extremely convenient. Um, there's less travel. If you're very well and very stable, you might not feel like taking a day off work to come all the way to the hospital, etc. So if clinically appropriate, um, the plan is, is that it incre this increased access to technology, which may make and people's lives um, easier will continue. Next slide. Um, and as I said, that means that we may be able to see you together with your GP, even if you don't have technology at home. We're already, we've already started using it for our metabolic outreach clinics. If you are admitted to your local hospital with an emergency, it's something that we could use to liaise with your local hospital. Um, for us, it's also very important um, that it we the trainee doctors, if you don't mind, so patients don't mind, are allowed to participate in these video consultations. Um, so the pandemic has really decimated um, normal training for our trainee doctors in inherited metabolic disease, and almost all of them have been redeployed to the COVID wards and are only gradually starting to return to the metabolic team. So we'd be very grateful if as a patient group, you would allow the trainee doctors to join in on video consultations. There's also another initiative being considered um, that's called patient initiated appointments. So there are quite a few people with inherited metabolic disease who the diagnosis is made, they're prescribed a treatment, that treatment keeps them really, really well. Um, and yet they have to come to hospital every year to check in with us because otherwise we're not allowed to prescribe their treatment or they get lost to follow up or if they do need to be seen, it's a very uh, convoluted process to get back to us. You have to go back to your GP, you have to ask a referral, you have to go for on a waiting list. Patient initiated appointments would mean that you could be known to a centre, your, um, your treatment could be prescribed, perhaps it's just an emergency regimen in case you need it. Um, and you could remain on the open books, as it were, and only come and see us physically if you needed to, so that you would be able to initiate your own appointment. Um, so it might work, for example, for women who have a metabolic disease, who are very well, who have a very straightforward treatment, but then might be considering planning a pregnancy and might wish to come and talk to us specifically about that. So that's something that's under consideration and I think would be a positive thing going forward. Next slide. There are issues with telephone and video consultations and they definitely don't work for everyone. Um, they're less personal. It's much harder for us to pick up on non-verbal cues. We recognise that not everybody has access to the appropriate technology. We're hoping that we can work with GPs to support this in future. Um, it is more challenging um, if you've got visual or hearing impairment clearly, if you're a non-native English speaker. There will be the capacity to introduce interpreters onto the line, but nonetheless, things can be challenging. We obviously can't examine you or arrange tests on the same day, and that's something we need to look at. Getting blood tests over the period of pandemic for patients with inherited metabolic disease has been challenging overall. Um, you, prob you may or may not know, but when you come to, to the specialist metabolic center and have a blood test, that blood test is not necessarily easily available at your own local hospital and certainly probably not via your GP. And that's because a lot of the time the actual blood sample once it's taken needs a very specific processing that often needs to happen quite quickly within an hour. The sample itself might need, might need to be stored 
um, frozen um, before it can be analysed. Um, and that's challenging if, if blood samples are taken away from the specialist metabolic centre. So we're looking into this. We've got a separate workflow and we've been talking to NHS England about how we might be able to make this work with the support of MetBioNet, which is the network of specialist metabolic laboratories. And we're looking at using something that we call blood spot technology, where a, a sample of blood can be spotted onto a, a piece of card effectively, and that can go into the normal post. So there's work going on behind the scenes, but we, we certainly haven't solved this issue yet. One of the other things the dietitians have pointed out to us um, is that they need weights and heights, particularly for children who are growing in order to adjust diets um, and something you could do if you've been asked about a weight and height on a telephone consultation is consider buying a home scales um, and a tape measure uh, and you may feel it's not as accurate as what's done in hospital but it would it would be hugely helpful even um, and that home scales are very good these days. Next slide please. What about restarting enzyme replacement therapy? We said that our feeling is that for most patients, the risk benefit is now in favor of restarting enzyme replacement therapy over the next few months. Um, reasons for this are that many more of you are starting to contact us to say that you've had recurrence of symptoms. And for some people that has meant that they restarted DRT. Um, the R value is lower in the community. We have capacity to treat you if you're unwell. Importantly, the home care companies have now very comprehensive plans in place, including access to appropriate personal protective equipment to protect you and them, and general overall infection control procedures. And many more of you have expressed an interest in becoming semi-independent with cannulation and infusions, and we're hoping to be able to support that. Next slide. So over the next few weeks, if you've previously been told to shield by your metabolic centre, then you should expect a letter or a contact from them informing you as to whether you should continue to shield or to follow the advice as per the general population. If you're not contacted or you're unsure, or importantly, feel that you have or have not been sent a letter in error, then please contact your metabolic team. Um, and if your ERT is currently on hold, your metabolic team will also discuss with you what happens next with regard to that. Next slide. So important thing here is um, ask somebody reliable. Um, so we'd rather, there, the internet is a fantastic thing and social media are fantastic things, but rumours can very quickly circulate. Nobody on social media will know your own individual circumstances um, or very much about your own individual condition and how it affects you. So ask your team. Um, if you're unable to approach your team directly, then do approach one of the reliable patient support organisations and they're very happy to collect questions and put them to us. Next slide. So I'm going to hand over to Roshni now to tell us a little bit more of the specifics with regard to the care of children. Thanks Elaine. Um, yep, next slide. Um, so I will just um, go over a little bit about questions that have been um, coming through um, about schooling and the um, paediatric inflammatory syndrome, but I'll just go over um, what we know already. So um, we're still, the government's still advising social distancing um, and isolation as much as possible and self-isolation as much as possible. Um, however, the rules had um, slightly changed um, overnight. Um, and there are higher risk groups um, still exist, but as we know, there haven't been any um, deaths and at, in our centre, we haven't had any children with metabolic conditions suffer from um, COVID-19. And, and it still stands that children have either a very mild illness um, or no symptoms at all, um, potentially from um, the respiratory side um, of this um, particular virus. Um, next slide. Um, and shielding, um, as Elaine had said, there are new guidelines on the RCPCH website um, and they have um, split the groups into um, two um, and you can have a look on the website to see um, what's included. But the mainly the groups um, are that continued that are advised to continue shielding are those with immunodeficiency and oncology um, patients. So for our patients, I think the main message really is to contact your metabolic center if you're not sure about continuing to shield or not. But those that are currently advised to shield should continue to do so for the moment until the 30th of 
June um, and I understand the situation will be um, reviewed. Um, however, currently patients can, should continue to take precautions but can leave home if they wish but continue to practice social distancing um, and maintain um, hand hygiene and respiratory um, hygiene as much as possible and avoiding any gatherings um, indoors um, and you should continue to avoid anyone who is symptomatic. Uh, next slide. Um, we continue with our advice during um, an emergency or during an acute illness at home. So continue um, as advised for your particular metabolic condition with your oral emergency regime um, or other advice as appropriate. Contact your metabolic team, perhaps even just to let them know. Um, if the oral emergency regime isn't tolerated at home, then again, we're continuing to advise um, presenting to the local hospital if necessary um, and to contact your metabolic centre um, and we have been trying to phone ahead to see what the procedures are locally and as far as I know the majority of hospitals are continuing to separate um, patients with symptoms um, to patients without symptoms um, and, and obviously using PPE as directed and obviously not to delay um, seeking help for any treatment. Next slide. Um, a little bit about the paediatric inflammatory syndrome um, of which here um, at Evelina there were a few cases and a few weeks ago there was a lot of um, flurry around it but it, I must say it certainly calmed down in the last few weeks but essentially the, these were a group, a subgroup of children and I understand there were less than 100 in the UK and there were no deaths as far as I know. Um, this is a child presenting with a persistent fever and very high fever, evidence of inflammation and evidence of either single or multi-organ dysfunction and there were some majority, a lot of the children had cardiac involvement. There may have been some criteria or fitting with this Kawasaki disease or toxic shock syndrome. Other organisms were excluded as a cause and, and the majority of children were COVID positive, but some were certainly negative and but displayed the same symptoms. And treatments um, have been um, established as far as I know there were guidelines on the RCPCH but essentially these children are being managed by at specialist centres by paediatric infectious disease specialists and cardiologists and rheumatologists um, so hopefully um, that um, peak has gone. Um, next slide. Um, there were a couple of um, questions about testing and asymptomatic testing. So for our hospital, I'm sure all the same, currently all inpatient, all children that are inpatients are being tested. And for elective admissions at the moment, um, which are picking up a little, we have a green pathway. So we're advising um, patients that are going to come in to shield for 14 days prior to this elective admission. And we will arrange testing 48 hours prior to admission by either posting out the test um, or arranging for a nurse to visit the home. We are currently advising patients not to travel to the hospital on public transport um, and we will arrange um, transport as necessary. Um, testing for asymptomatic individuals for the moment is um, a little bit uncertain. Next slide. So returning to school, um, we are essentially the advice is to um, for children that have been advised to continue shielding. Um, again, this may need to be discussed with their individual metabolic centres. We're advising them to continue shielding and not return to school. However, um, we are advising other children to continue returning to school as advised, as their year group does. Um, and siblings of children or vulnerable children are again also advised to return to school as per their year groups. Um, uh, and essentially, I think these will be questions for individual metabolic teams with regards to who's shielding and who's not shielding um, and siblings in the household returning to school. Um, but for us, the majority um, of children, we are advising to return to school because I think it's um, beneficial to their um, learning and social needs. Next, next slide. Um, there were a couple of questions. So should children with metabolic disorders and or their siblings, including those not shielding, but social distancing, return to school? So we, I said yes. 
Um, and if unaffected shield siblings can go, what safeguarding measures can be put in place for patients in the household? And again, I think we need to continue with the standard guidelines for hand hygiene for anyone that's left the house and come back in and respiratory hygiene as much as possible um, and anyone that's displaying symptoms. Next slide. I hand over to Simon. Thanks, Roshni. Um, and, uh, and I'll try and speed up because I note that we've gone over time already. And um, uh, I think the, uh, the shielding discussions are by far the most important here. I'm a paediatrician from Manchester. We'll just discuss briefly the impact of COVID on uh, research. Um, clearly, many of the uh, metabolic centres are very research active and many of you as metabolic patients may have been involved in research trials. Now, when the coronavirus um, crisis hit the NHS earlier this year, most clinical trials uh, were suspended or paused, um, really to make sure that the hospital systems uh, could cope with the uh, expected uh, huge number of patients. Um, and so that in some cases meant that uh, systems were realigned purely to do with acute uh, cases and some staff uh, were indeed redeployed to other um, uh, tasks such as intensive care. So the only trials that continued to run were those essential for delivery of a treatment not otherwise available and a number of those uh, were metabolic studies, in fact more of those than in other areas I suspect. Um, but research staff were also asked to become part of regional and nationally prioritised trials and research related to COVID-19. This is clearly something that we knew very little about, a new virus uh, in humans and therefore researchers needed to understand it more and this in part was about testing trials to look at the tests themselves and then to work out how many people have been affected um, both in terms of having the disease or uh, those who um, uh, have now got antibodies against the disease and uh, some of that work has contributed to the graphs that Robin was showing you earlier uh, and increasingly to uh, either treatment trials or vaccine trials aiming to try and manage uh, this infection moving forward. Um, and so staff who previously may have worked on metabolic trials are now focused on, on these. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as, <clears throat> as however we've heard, uh, with the decreasing number of uh, COVID-19 cases, uh, we are trying to plot a return uh, throughout the NHS to more routine uh, planned care. Uh, and as well as what that means for our clinical services, that also reflects on research services. Um, and we are very keen to open uh, a number of the clinical trials that uh, have been suspended during the, this period of time, um, but also to open some of the new trials that we've been working on uh, getting approved in the meantime. And, and again, this, the, these, these can affect a number of metabolic disorders and can be new, new treatments. Uh, or treatments uh, where there have not been any before. So this is important and it's not just uh, a luxury item, if you like. Um, however, doing this is challenging. We need the research staff to be deployed back to research teams once again, uh, but we also need hospitals to be open to be able to deliver these trials and all of the support services. For example, radiology, um, scans, um, physiotherapists, all of these other parts uh, of the hospital that allow us to do these trials. They need to be open and working and functioning again. And we have to be sure that it's right for our patients on trials to come into hospital to have these visits. And this has been also challenging with many of you being shielded. And quite what this means uh, in terms of a shielded patient coming to hospital for a research study, which is more important, protection from COVID or receiving your research related um, therapy uh, is, is really an individual judgment and uh, we've been having to make these on and off um, over the last few weeks and months. Um, so we are uh, on, in a trust by trust way um, trying to reopen trials uh, and uh, as much as possible and we're trying to do this as safely but as quickly as possible um, but this is likely to vary significantly across the country. Um, and that may vary from centre to centre and trials may open in some centres before others. And I would ask you all to bear with us. Uh, this is not uh, inequality or uh, variation in access. This is simply um, 
uh, everyone trying to do the safest and most sensible thing um, for their um, patients uh, based on their local circumstances. So uh, I hope that we will be open and we are in fact opening trials uh, week by week, um, but we must do this safely and carefully uh, and just keep in touch with your teams uh, about this. Thank you. Next slide. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about uh, coping and mental well-being. So if we go on to the next slide. At the first of these webinars, um, I talked about some of the normal, understandable feelings that you might experience around the start of lockdown in the UK and some practical strategies that might help manage. And those things are probably still relevant now, so I'd encourage you to revisit them. Um, what we do have now is a better idea of some of the individual problems and challenges that have faced us. And they're, they're different for everybody. Um, I saw this quote from a doctor who helped manage COVID-19 in Canada. She said, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boats. So for example, some people are juggling working and homeschooling at the same time. Some people are key workers trying to find a way to get to work and to do their job safely. Some people live alone and have been coping with uh, feeling more isolated, while some people live with other people and have been coping with the pressures of spending a lot more time around those people than they might be used to. Um, a lot of you are following shielding guidelines, I know, or managing carers or treatments and having to make some difficult decisions around that. Some people might have felt quite safe isolating at home, but are struggling with the idea of the restrictions being relaxed now. And those decisions are even more difficult because there's still a lot we don't know about how the pandemic will unfold in the future. And uncertainty often brings with it feelings of anxiety and we face it to some extent every day, but it's especially heightened now. And like I said before at the first webinar, if those feelings are having a really big impact on you, if they're stopping you from enjoying things or from doing the things you need to, please do ask for some more help. Um, you can talk to your metabolic team, you can talk to your GP, you can look back at the links at the end of the first webinar. Um, and if it's an emergency, you can call 999 or you can go to a &E. um, I'm going to talk just about a couple of psychological tools. Uh, those are goal setting and problem solving. They're tools that we really often use in cognitive behaviour therapy or CBT, which I know a lot of you will have heard of before. Um, I don't have time to go into them in a lot of detail today, but I wanted to give you an overview uh, of these couple of techniques that might help you feel more equipped to face your own individual challenges at the moment. So if we just go to the next slide, might be a good time to set some positive goals now for the next few months. And you might want to think about goals across a few different areas. So things like hobbies, social activities, work or school or college, managing your health. And when you're deciding uh, what goals are important to you, it can help to spend some time uh, thinking about your values. So values reflect what's most important to you deep down. Uh, some examples of values might be being a good parent or sibling or partner, maybe keeping learning and developing, maybe building supportive friendships or contributing to your community, for example. They're the things that give the direction, not the destination. So it's not something you can ever achieve or tick off. It's something that you have to constantly be working towards or acting in line with. Um, and that means that even though the situation might change and your goals might need to be a bit flexible, um, the underlying values will stay the same. So hopefully if you're in touch with those, they can help you to think of ways to adjust your goals if life does get in the way. Make sure that any goals are realistic and achievable. Um, of course, they are going to be restricted by the current situation and perhaps also by the effects of a metabolic disorder. Um, make them specific too, so specify what it is you want to do, how often and for how long. So some examples of specific goals might be to get up by 9am every day, uh, to take a 15 minute walk once a day, or uh, to spend 30 minutes having a video chat with a friend twice a week. Break the goals down into steps and build up to them gradually. Um, so for example, purely an example, if your goal was to go out and walk for 15 minutes each day, you might start by going out with someone who you live with for five minutes of really slow walking and, and gradually build it up. Make the steps as small as they need to be to go at your pace. Uh, remember to keep a note of your progress and to celebrate all your successes. And if we just want to the next slide, you might be making some really tricky decisions. You might be deciding whether or not to spend some time outside, whether to restart a treatment, uh, whether to send a child who isn't shielding back to school, those kinds of things. 
And sometimes setting some time aside to think through that decision in an organized, structured way can help give you some clarity, especially if it's a decision that feels quite emotional that might be making you feel a bit overwhelmed. So in CBT, we break this process down into six steps. Um, first of all, identify the problem, define it and write it down. And it might be a good point to note what emotions are associated with that problem. List all the possible solutions you can think of. So be really creative, think outside the box, get them all down. Um, and then after that, maybe get rid of any that are not practical, not realistic, for whatever reason you're not going to use, and list the remaining ones in order of your preference. And maybe pick the, the top few, that might be three or four if you have that many, uh, and write a list of the advantages and disadvantages of each one. So by comparing those advantages and disadvantages, hopefully it will help you to decide on a plan. Once you've got a plan, to break it down into steps like I spoke about before, uh, and while you work through the steps, keep checking how well it's working, spend some time evaluating what went well, what didn't go so well, do you need to make any changes or do something differently next time. Don't expect it to go perfectly, try to be patient and kind with yourself if things don't go how you planned. That time to evaluate is a really good opportunity to learn lots of useful stuff for the future. Uh, it's okay to work through those steps by talking them through with someone that you trust or to write down each of the stages on a blank piece of paper. If you prefer a worksheet to fill in, you can download some example ones at the web address that I've put on the slide. Um, so I can't tell you what's going to be the best or right thing for your situation, for your own individual vote. Um, but I hope those couple of tools will help you get back some control over the areas where you can have control and feel a bit more confident that the decisions, decisions you're making are the right ones for you and for your family with the information that we have at the moment. So I'm going to hand back over to the chairs. Thank you very much. Um, so I think, Will, we, we are a bit over on time, uh, but Will, um, maybe we can have a, a summary and a, a recap of some of the questions that have been sent through. Uh, yes, yes. So um, thanks all speakers for some you know, great presentations. It's um, a lot has changed since the initial one um, and still quite a lot of uncertainty. But I think the important thing to note is the uncertainty is often with everybody involved, it's not, um, you know, the clinicians as well, there can be some uncertainty. Um, I think there were a few questions more, as, as we said at the beginning, it's hard to address individual and disease specific questions, but there's some broader themes. Um, one, maybe just for clarity. Um, so should household members, um, such as siblings or parents of those of individuals who are currently shielding, are they able to return to work or, or to school as schools start to reopen? I can try and answer that, Will, if you want. Okay. Um, yes, but I think we're, I think we're advising, um, yes. Um, I guess, again, it's dependent on individual conditions and individual metabolic centers, but for the majority, I can't think of any of our children where we're not um, advising them to go back to siblings, to go back to school all parents to go to work for, for the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, another kind of more general thematic question um, w was about how will patients who aren't under a metabolic centre be informed if they should remain on a shielding list or who should they contact? Um, perhaps Robin might be able to address that if he's still available. Yeah, I'm here. Um, so that it's really going to be the GPs, I think, going forwards, who are going to be answering those sort of questions. NHS England has progressively shifted the responsibility for that. So if you have a metabolic centre, they will certainly be the best people to advise you. If you're actually shielding, I'd find it quite unlikely that you might not be under a metabolic centre, but you should have a someone in hospital looking after you, be it a neurologist or a kidney doctor or someone else, and they'd also be able to advise. Um, but as we talked about earlier, if you're shielding, you're really, you're really quite, you have a significant disease, um, and there should be some clinician um, who you'd be able to get hold of and actually ask the questions. Thank you, Robin. Um, and, I, and I think that kind of follows neatly on to um, 
although, as I said, we can't address individual diseases, there were some kind of quite specific um, questions about your disease. And as has been kind of emphasized throughout the different presentations, if you're uncertain, do contact your metabolic specialist or your other specialist. Um, but broad theme for the people who should be shielding are people who have a reason to be immunosuppressed or they've got significant respiratory condition or unique to our community ones who are at a severe risk of decompensation. So lots of the conditions that we look after, Neiman Pick type C, for example, which I'm, that disease per se doesn't mean you need to shield. There may be features of your disease which, and treatments that mean you may need to be shielded, uh, but the diagnosis itself per se doesn't necessarily mean you're in, the, in that extremely vulnerable group. Um, the, uh, another question uh, theme was about emergency regimes. Um, how can people ensure they've got an up-to-date emergency regime? Uh, I can answer that if you like. So your metabolic team will be able to give you an up-to-date emergency regime. I presume by asking the question, you may no longer be in contact with your metabolic team. Um, I think it would be very challenging for GPs to provide emergency regimes. That's quite specialist thing. But what you may wish to do is to contact your GP and ask for a referral um, to your local metabolic centre. Uh, and then an emergency regimen could be sorted out quite quickly. Or if you're unsure, um, I would say contact Metabolic Support UK, who can tell you where your nearest centre is. Most of us would respond quite quickly to that need. And in fact, we had quite a few um, patients who'd been lost to follow up from specialist centres who within the first few weeks of the pandemic contacted us. And though we've not had a chance to meet those patients yet, we have sent them all an emergency regimen. Um, so I would say contact Metabolic Support UK who can put you in touch with us or contact your GP and ask for a referral. Some GPs had stopped doing referrals when they were very busy at the beginning of the pandemic, but I believe uh, and Will will probably be able to confirm this, that has all restarted now. So you should be able to get one if needed. Um, great, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Yes, um, yeah, I mean, it certainly would be very difficult for a GP to to give clear guidance on an emergency regime and we would be deferring to uh, the, the specialists um, regarding that. Um, uh, there was another question which um, perhaps I can address partly and maybe Robin may wish to contribute as well, which was about ongoing shielding letters. Will they be better targeted or will they continue to be simply the umbrella coded terms right at the start? Um, I think one thing to say is this is not a, just a problem to uniquely to rare diseases. There were lots of far more common conditions where people received inappropriate letters. Um, certainly I know of quite a large number of patients in my practice who have sickle cell trait, um, who received a shielding letter um, inappropriately. Um, and that was something that that was then undone. And this was all, as we said, all to do with the coding. So certainly at a primary care level, but also the secondary care level, you can both add patients to the shielding list, but you can also remove patients from a shielding list. And certainly updating the primary care record with a moderate risk code, when every week that list was reviewed, um, taken by NHS England, and then the, the kind of master list was modified. Um, I don't know whether Robin wants to add anything else to that. Yeah, I, I think we need to wait and see what they announce in the next week or two for what's going to happen after the end of June. Um, and I think until they've done that, it's very difficult to know. I think it's quite likely that the, the tool, if you like, which was the coding they used to identify patients is going to change a bit. Um, and indeed, the criteria may change a bit and become much more individualised. But um, I haven't seen anything about that yet. Um, so I think we'll just have to wait and see. Certainly, NHS England are very much aware that the way they did it the first time around led to a number of problems. Um, great. I think perhaps um, we'll just, there was one more question I'll just um, bring to the panel. Um, Patients who are shielding, does anyone have any insights whether they will be, uh, they are prioritized for testing, um, including, I guess, antibody testing, uh, but also are, will those be a group that are likely to be prioritized for vaccination? So the answer to that is, uh, is nobody knows 
as of yet. Um, so as far as testing goes, um, although everybody is who thinks they need a test is supposed to be able to ask for one and get one from their GP. So whether you're shielded or not, if you want to get tested, the government line is that that is available to you um, and you can request a testing kit. Um, and, but there certainly is no move to prioritize that group. Antibody testing is not generally available yet. It's um, being rolled out. The NHS is targeting healthcare um, staff at the moment, which actually seems like the sensible thing to do. Um, there are various antibody kits you can buy for yourself over the internet. None of those have been shown to be in any way reliable and would not be recommended. I don't think you could trust the result you got, be it positive or negative. Uh, we don't have a vaccine yet, so I don't think anyone has started to engage with who you vaccinate first, but given that the priority has been to protect the vulnerable, certainly it would make sense if you were aiming your vaccine at the vulnerable and certainly with flu vaccine, um, that's what they do every year. But I think until we have a vaccine, it's going to be very difficult to know how it's going to be delivered. Um, great, thank you, Robin. Um, I think uh, there was a, a, a few questions just more generally about which I think have been addressed already about people who would be classified as moderate risk, um, not in the extremely vulnerable groups. So um, the, the, with regards to them returning to work and to school, um, I think as, as is meant, they should try to self-isolate, but if their work requires them to return um, and there is no alternative, then the current recommendation, as I understand it, is that they can return to work. Obviously, that's a risk they need to take into consideration themselves. Um, Fine. I think we're coming towards the end, so I'll, I will pass over to um, Ellen just to to close and to thank. But uh, I think one thing that I would say is what is what is very clear is a lot of the decisions are quite patient specific, um, and it's sometimes quite difficult to make disease specific guidance. Um, and that's why liaising with your um, metabolic specialist, or if you're not under a metabolic specialist, the most appropriate clinician is very important. Um, and so I'd encourage you to reach out to them for those questions. And also that the patient support groups um, are available. And certainly there have been a couple of questions about financial advice um, and um, advice regarding benefits. And the patient support groups certainly are one Neiman Pick UK, but many of the other ones that represent our groups, such as Metabolic Support uh, UK as well, can offer guidance and direction there. Um, so I will, I'll pass over to, to Ellen just to round up. Yeah, so um, it's just left for me to say a huge thank you to uh, all the panel speakers for uh, coming together and uh, working with the patient advocacy to deliver uh, <clears throat> this trusted information to you at this difficult time. Um, so a huge thank you uh, for, for all the panelists. Um, and as, as Will just mentioned, please do reach out to your patient advocacy groups for any additional support or advice. And um, Hopefully, we can continue offering these webinars uh, again in the future, um, and uh, we welcome any feedback of, of future uh, ideas or topics that would be important for you as well. So, um, thank you all very much for joining, and uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day.